the way that you ask them questions for you to figure that out for them, you don't have to give them all the answers, but for you to figure that out, for you to know if you can even help them and how you could help them, you're going to ask a couple key curious questions. They may be different for every person on the call. That's why I don't like um, scripts. The framework of it is the same. It's like, what do I need to know to be able to see if I could see this person's vision for them? I had quite the aha moment during this recording. Now, fun fact, I invited Lisa Dad to chat with my VIP media mentoring clients. So we do a training once a month and I just ask the people in my program, hey, what do you want to learn more about? If I don't know, then I'm going to invite somebody on who does know. And Lisa Dad was that person. So I'm going to let you in on a sales training that she went through with me specifically. And this is for anybody who has to make sales. So if you are a business owner or if you are a side hustler, this is for you because you have to make sales. You have to make money. And honest to God, even if you are somebody who doesn't have a side hustle, doesn't have a business of their own, maybe you're working in corporate America and you have no desire to leave, you still probably have to sell something to somebody at some point in your career, whether it be sales to buy something or, for example, in the PR business, it's you're selling a story idea or a story to a media outlet. So this is just one of those episodes that you have to listen to, even if you are a salesperson, because I feel like she says things and makes you realize things that you never even thought about. So I think you're going to like this episode. I really liked it. I loved this experience with Lisa as she kind of went through a sales training with me. So yeah, pay attention and ask yourself the questions that Lisa asked me during this sales training that I recorded for my VIP media mentoring clients that you get to listen in on. And if you want to know more about the media mentoring program, I will link to it in the show notes of this episode. You can also always visit mediamentoringprogram.com. If you aren't familiar with it, this is something that I created for small business owners who can't afford to hire a PR agency. So you are paying a fraction of the price to get training from me, a PR agency owner, and my team. You can implement all this on your own with just two hours a week, or you can have your VA implement this with you. Again, just two hours a week to act as your own publicist, get all that publicity, and turn it into profit. Again, you can learn more about that at mediamentoringprogram.com. But for now, let's talk sales with Lisa Dad. wonder how some people seem to get all the media coverage, but you don't? Go behind the scenes with a TV reporter, national on-air host, and news contributor who has interviewed celebrities, took you inside the Versace mansion, and even stood on a chair to interview basketball legend Alonzo Mourning. Get ready, because Become a Media Maven is the podcast where Christina Nicholson is sharing secrets from her years in front of the camera, in the editing booth, and now behind the podcast mic. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me. I'm super excited to chat with you because one of the things that I hated when I started my business was the sales portion of it. And I hear this from so many business owners that they don't want to do sales. They hate sales. But like the truth of the matter is, is if you're not making sales, you're not in business. So like, let's just get out of the way. Why do you think people hate sales so much? Yeah. So thank you for having me first off. (laughs) And I also hear this all the time and it's actually why I got back into sales. So I have a background in corporate sales and marketing. And when I left, I wanted nothing to, to do with sales or marketing just because I was looking Uh, I was looking for a real change in my life, but what brought me back is exactly what you're saying is I had so many friends who are also business owners who kept complaining. I hate sales. I hate sales. And I thought, oh my gosh, you're killing me. Why don't I just teach you a way that's not so awful or so icky for you? Um, I think there's two main, I'll give you two big reasons. I think people don't like sales. The first one is there's a lot of pressure to it. As you said, you don't, if you don't, don't have sales, you don't have a business, you have a hobby right? Every business in order to be successful needs sales. So the, it's, there's a lot of at stake with sales. I think that's first, that's the first off thing. It puts pressure on people. 
The second thing I think is that most people are actually never really trained properly in sales. Um, and I will talk about traditional selling compared to the way I train sales now is, is very different. But in general, most people aren't really, to really taught how to do sales in a really natural way. And so immediately business owners think they have to wear a sales hat. It's like, I, I get to be this other person in normal life. And then once I'm in a sales conversation, I have to be a salesperson. And because we don't even know really what that is, um, that is where all of a sudden our fears start to pop up. And you say that you don't have to necessarily be a quote unquote salesperson. So if you're making sales, say you're on a sales call with somebody, what do you do to not be a salesperson, but your end goal is to sell them something? Can you kind of explain what you mean by that? Absolutely. Okay. So what I mean by that is when I say, and I love training people that are actually non-sales people. So I used to have, I used to be a salesperson for a sales team and I used to manage salespeople and I used to be a marketer directing sales teams. So I used to work a lot with people that their role specifically was just sales. I work more now with consultants and business owners who happen to need to sell in order for their businesses to grow. What I say about, you don't have to be a salesperson is you don't have to, uh, what I'm saying is you don't need to be most people. Well, let me ask you this question. When I say a salesperson, what do you think of? Um, I feel, I think of like a sleazy person who's over the top and doesn't really care about you or what you want. They just want to sell something regardless of whether you want it or need it. Okay, perfect. So in your mind, the word salesperson means that. So now if you're a business owner and you're like, oh no, I got to go do a sales call and your body starts to reject the notion of like, okay, that means I need to be sleazy and I need to care about the sale more than anything else. And I got to be really pushy. So then you go into the call and you're like, that's what you think a salesperson is. You know, you don't want to be that. And so your ego and your heart and soul are like sort of uh, almost uh, fighting over this. It's like, I feel like I'd have to be that, but I don't really want to be that. <laughs> so when I say you don't have to be a salesperson, I'm really talking about the idea that you don't have to be someone else. You can actually be who you are and still do the act of selling. So then how do you identify and utilize your natural approach to sales? Like there's not a one size fits all. So how do you know? what to do, what to say, how to say it when you are on a sales call, if you're like, okay, get rid of everything you've imagined sales to be or everything you've even experienced being on the receiving end of a salesperson. So how do you, how do you kind of figure out what your approach is or what it should be? Yeah. So I have, I have short and long answers for this, of course, because this is the kind of training that I do with people. The reason I call my process soul sales is because I use a powerful tool called soul language. It's a, an assessment tool. It's 91 question assessment tool that actually gives people their soul sales archetype. And we'll talk about that in a moment, but let me just first start with more of a simple, a simple way is that the, the more you understand about your natural approach to everyday things aside from selling that starts to give you an indication of who you can be and how you can approach sales. So that's where I start with people is that when we start to recognize my, my understanding and my belief of this, especially as I use the soul language tool with people is that your most natural approach is also your most naturally enrolling. And I use the word enroll and buy in um, as part of the way I talk about sales. So how do you know what your natural approach is? Okay. So that's where we start to play. <laughs> <laughs> that's where we start to play with things. So one of the things I think, first of all, any, uh, the more we, you know, if you're a business owner, you know, this, the more you grow, the more your business grows, right? This radical self-awareness. I'm a proponent of radical self-awareness. The more that, you know, yourself, the more you can really allow for it and sink into it and actually grow. I'll use the phrase a lot with people. Um, there's a lot of growth hiding inside your comfort zone. And people will go, wait a second. We've always been taught, taught you have to go outside of your comfort zone. And my belief is that, that we forget that what does it feel like to be comfortable in our own skin? Like who really are we? When does it feel good for us in conversation? And we start to pay attention and be aware of that. That's the, that's the initial stages of it. And how do you help people do this? 
Well, so as I mentioned, the quickest way that I help people do this is I use the assessment tool, the soul language assessment. Other ways, if I'm doing a free, say, a workshop or training, I have people start to play with this in situations outside of sales. Okay, so sales already has a lot of energy around it. It's like I might not be able to pay my mortgage next month or my rent if I don't make a sale. So all of a sudden there's this fear and this scarcity and this energy around it, which is not really supportive. Or you'll go into you'll take yourself back into a time when you were in a sales situation, whether you were the salesperson or not, where it felt really awful, either if it was sleazy because it was someone else, or maybe just yourself, it felt awkward, or maybe you felt rejected because they said no. So the first thing I do with people is say, okay, let's set sales situation specifically aside for a moment. And let's, let's imagine who you, who you be when, when you're not in that space. So let me, let me ask you this question. When you were a little kid and you were allowed to spend time doing whatever you wanted, playing a game, playing with a certain toy or a certain hobby, what would you what would you spend your time doing mostly? I loved like arts and crafts. Okay. Why? What was it about arts and crafts that you loved? Um, I don't know. I just think I'm a creative person. I loved the colors. I loved just like the process of like making and creating things. Yeah. And did you create you create brand spanking new things or were you kind of modeling other people's stuff? Um, probably a little bit of both. Okay, perfect. And when you were, um, think about a time when you were with your friends as you got a little bit older and you were a teenager or early young adulthood, what role did you play with your friends? Like who, which friend were you? Uh, you're the one that everyone gave and went to for advice, or were you the one that everyone went to for a sympathetic ear, or you were the one that, what were, what would you say? How would you describe your role in your friend group? Yeah. I mean, I would say I was that I was always like very social and very active and outgoing. So like always the one, like you want to go do something, you want to go out, what should we do that? Like, like the social chair, I guess you would say. Yeah. You were the social person that you were the one that everyone knew if like, if nothing was going on, you were the one that was going to create the event that was going to, okay. We're all yeah. Gonna- yeah. Kind of It's like total opposite of what I am now, but yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, And so I start asking these types of questions. I start to hear a little bit of your soul language come through. And of course, um, the tool is much more discerning than what we're playing right now. But I want people to start to recognize how they show up and who they show up as. Um, What would you say right now is your superpower in the way that you work with clients right now or your your own uh, customers and clients? I think it's strategy for sure. Like not necessarily executing. Like with my PR agency, I have a team that executes just because they're better executors. But when it comes to like strategy and planning and like seeing the longer term, bigger picture of going from problem to solution, I think that's like my strong suit. Okay. So you even a couple words I'll I'll describe, I'll reflect back to you that stand out even more for for you than strategy. Because a lot of people say, I'm really good at strategy. Right. But what is the energy underneath that that's unique to you? Because soul language is about the energy underneath it, right? So there could be seven people in the room. They're all really good at strategy, but they do it from a different place. And then you said, I'm really good at seeing the bigger picture. It's like you have a vision that other people don't see. You're fur- you see further down the, the road than they can. Is that is that what you said? Yeah, like planning out like long-term specifically week by week, month by month of what to execute to get the goal. So it's not just like general strategy, but drilling down on specifics. Ah, got it. Okay. And are you a structure person? Do you like, do you like, yes. uh, oh, like, you are. <laughs> like a crazy structure organization productivity <laughs> person? Yes. <laughs> okay. A detail, are you detail oriented kind of? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you can see, even start to see the difference in the energy there where somebody who is like, there's lots of people that are really big vision thinkers, but would never be into the details and the step-by-step they're literally pie in the sky, play in that space. And then for the rest of it, they would need somebody else. (laughs) But the fact that you bring in specifically, you can see the vision, but you're more like, and I see every step in between. I've got all the specific stuff um, that you need to go from A to B. Um, would did you uh, did you play any leader roles when you were a, a kid? Were you ever the leader of the group or were you? Yeah, more- yeah. Like I was always in student council. I was always like in cheerleading, and yeah, like always just like kind of taking charge to like organize and just like get shit done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So there's a couple, there's a bunch of different, we can play with a bunch of different um, soul language archetypes. It's an archetype program, by the way, soul language, there's seven different archetypes, but instead of guessing specifically what yours is, because I, the tool does such a good job with it. I would say we start to, we start to use the awareness that you have right now to guide you in terms of how you can show up for sales conversations. So when you're in a sales conversation and a lot of people think you have to give somebody a free service so they experience you. And that's not, that's not actually what's, that's not actually necessary. But when you're on a sales conversation, when you can be that person who sees all of the steps and can guide people in that way through even your conversation, when you allow that energy to show up, that is the best way for you to lead a sales conversation. Okay. So then how would you like specifically just based off of what I told you, like, how would I implement those natural abilities in a sales conversation? Like, how would I? Yeah. So, um, so let's start with the fact that we're going to start with, um, the intention of your sales conversations. First of all, do you, okay. So I'm not very big on following scripts and I don't give people scripts. I want you to follow your own natural way of being. So it doesn't make sense to give you a script, but it give, give you a framework for that. Okay. So in a framework, when you, do you do sales calls right now? I do. Yeah. Yeah, you, you do. Okay. And do you use a, a do you use um, steps or, or a script that you've been given? Not necessarily a script, but I'm kind of like, what's your problem? And are you like interested in fixing this now? And if so, here's how I can help. And this is what it looks like. Like that's usually the format that I follow. Okay, perfect. So what I would say is that doesn't, and, and does that work fairly well for you? Uh, it depends on who I'm talking to. <laughs> I, yeah, I need to right. do a better job. And I try to like, before I get on a sales call with people and you let me know what you think of this before I get a, on a sales call with people, I, I have people fill out like a short little form just so I can get a better idea of who they are, what their goals are and what their company is just so I can do a little research before. And I also get their budget because if they don't have a budget to hire me, then I want to give them other resources that could help them now until they have the budget. Yeah. But I find that people, maybe they're not completely honest about their budget, or maybe I just didn't do a good job on the call because afterwards they either don't have the budget after they said they had the budget, or I'm just kind of like doing the whole follow-up once every week until I get a no type of thing. Oh yeah. Got it. No, no, we don't like that. I like no's to be quick as, as quick as yes is. Same, <laughs> same. Yeah. Like, don't waste right. my time. Like, let me know so I can move on. <laughs> Right. So, okay. So let's go, we're going to tie this all together, by the way. So I'm kind of jumping all over the place, but you're giving me a lot of information already. And hopefully uh, everyone that's listening will also think about their own processes because I want to show you, I want to bring to your attention that you're actually already limiting a little bit of your genius in the way that you lead your sales conversations. And I'm going to show you what that is. Okay. So you, we, we, we've already sort of determined from you. And again, I don't, we're doing this very quick. So this is kind of the Cole's notes version. You're really good at seeing big picture and vision and knowing all the steps to take. And when you, your sales conversation is what's starting off with the energy, and I know you do more than this, but let's just go from the, what you gave me, what's your problem and, and, and how important is it to solve for you? You're blocking off some of your genius because you're the one that can see the bigger vision than for them. So in your sales conversations, you absolutely need to know enough information to understand their situation. But for you, we, you got to allow yourself to, and you probably do this for the sales calls that have been successful. You naturally probably go into this space where you're like, Ooh, okay. I just got enough information to see something really big for you. And when you allow yourself to go, wow, I really see this for you. And there's some key steps that it sounds like you're not even touching at all right now in order to get there. So you know what I'm saying? So now you, you've given them a, a, a little window into the fact that, oh, wow, when you, when you share that with them, a bit of the vision there, that's when they have the opportunity to go, wow, I didn't even see that. But if you're as good as you say you are at that, you, it should connect with the person. Now, in order to do that, you have to have been curious enough to ask the, the questions that would give you that. That makes sense. And a lot of times it's funny because I'll go into sales conversations, you know, based on this form that people fill out and then I'll have like ideas in my mind of what they need. But during the conversation, I'm like, oh, well, you thought you needed this, but you actually need this after chatting with you. Or wow. sometimes they're just not a fit at all. And then I'll refer them to somebody else. So like, is that what you mean? Like talking well, yes. with them you to drill down deeper? 
Yeah, well, yes and no. So I do agree with you. So here's the piece. Uh, for those of you, uh, yourself included, and anyone listening that has a application process, I think that's a great efficient way of ruling some people out. I also think, you know, when people say, do I say the price is right away or not? I think you can give the prices in some instances to scare away people that really can not afford you, right? So if you say, look, my private services start at $20,000, you're going to scare off some of those people that don't, you know, don't have $20,000 or that could not find it if they needed to, right? And that's okay. So I think that's an efficient use of your time is definitely asking certain questions that will rule people out. Or if you say, you know, say, who, who, who do you um, primarily work with? Give me that indication for a minute. Right. So on the agency side, it's businesses that are doing at least 2 million in revenue. They usually have a director of marketing in place and they probably worked with a PR agency before and they're just looking for a change. Um, And this can, you know, range from brick and mortars to online businesses, whether it be e-commerce, even people who just want to build their personal brands. And then on my mentoring program side, it's usually for people making less than a hundred thousand a year. And they can't afford to hire an agency. So they need to know how to act as their own publicist, or they need to put their VA through my training so they can execute what's in there. Got it. So perfect. Because then your application process should automatically sort them for you. Mm -hmm. Yep. So I think that's fabulous. You're going to ask the basic questions to, to, to rule people out is your main point. Yeah. Now when you get so so when you get someone on the, on the call, if you're marketing and you're a PR person, so I'm sure that this is dialed in for you. That when you're on a call with someone, that you have probably already an appropriate person on the call. Now, when it comes down to you saying, well, some of them say they have a budget, but they don't, and then they this money and time are the two easiest objections. So people will throw them out like like water, really. And so sometimes what we don't know is someone will say, well, I don't really have the budget. What they may be saying to you is you haven't sold me on the value of spending my money on that. Doesn't mean that they're swimming in money, but that can be actually what they're saying to you. I don't have the money right now. Um, And that's an easy thing to throw out if they're not bought in. It's just, it took you five calls to get that no instead of getting it at the beginning. Right. So the more that you're able to sink in to what you've been telling me so far. And again, this is rough cut because we're doing this rather quickly, but so you get these people on the call and you've got them a little bit sorted because of your application process. Once you get on the call with them, you got to go in with a bit of the assumption that they're somewhat worthy of your, of your, of your actual sales call. Right. Um, That's when I want you to go into pure curiosity mode as to what is it do I need to know in order to see where I would take this person from the big perspective, right? Mm-hmm. Not drilled into everything, but what, what is it you actually need to know from them instead of starting with like, so, you know, what's your, what's your challenge and how important is it to, to solve for you? I want you to start with their situation. I want you in a curious mode to gather enough information. So this is the difference. Instead of asking them, what's your problem? Most people really don't know. <laughs> right. That's true. So I'm saying that since your skill set, again, people that are listening, this isn't an answer for all of you, by the way, this isn't an answer specific to Christina. So when I train people on sales, I want you to tap into your own genius. Christina, you said my genius is I'm really good at strategic vision to see where people are need could go and the steps that will take them there. So given that that's yours, what I'm saying is when you get on the call, In order for them to really feel and experience your genius, the way that you ask them questions for you to figure that out for them, you don't have to give them all the answers, but for you to figure that out, for you to know if you can even help them and how you could help them, you're going to ask a couple key curious questions. They may be different for every person on the call. That's why I don't like um, scripts. The framework of it is the same. It's like, what do I need to know to be able to see if I could see this person's vision for them? I love that. So yeah, well, this, it just shifts your, it's, it, they sound like small tweaks, but they can be very big. It's like, well, let me give you a, a crazy odd example. When I go into a restaurant, I'm, I got too lazy trying to figure out what to eat. And so what I ask the waitress is, what is your favorite thing on this menu? Now, people will say, I ask that all the time too. I say, no, what you're asking is what's good here. And I used to be a waitress. When you say what's good here, that's, that's kind of like, well, I don't know everything. What am I? Yeah. (laughs) You're not going to say anything's bad if you're the waitress at the restaurant. 
Right. But I used to be a, wait a waitress. And what I know is waitresses work so hard and so long, they have to eat in their own restaurants. Otherwise, they, they don't eat. And so they know the menu well enough because they eat there all the time. <laughs> yeah. So if you ask a waitress, what is your favorite thing on this menu? Fascinating things happen. First of all, 95% of the time I order what they tell me, unless it's unless they love, I don't know, mushrooms and I don't. But 95% of the time I follow what they say and probably at least 95% of the time I'm happy with it. And, and the odd time, they recommend something that's not even really on their menu, but they order special. <laughs> and I say, then give me that. And they, and I find, I get this cool surprise, you know? So what my point is here is that a small tweak in the type of question that you ask will give you comp drastically different results. So if you want to tap into what your genius already is and you want to be you in this conversation, all the salespeople say, find out what their problem is and find out how important it is to them. Yes, from a big perspective, but from your own soul language, you're going to start to get really curious when you're actually working with a client, you probably know exactly what questions to ask them. So I'm saying, allow yourself to be in that curiosity mode to go, oh, do, 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 do. Okay. Wow. From what you've told me, it sounds like you think this is the problem, but what I'm seeing for you is actually do, 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 do. Mm-hmm. And I love like, that. You are like, wow. Oh my God, Christina, I didn't even see that. You see things yeah. I didn't see. So see how I am already kind of like bought in. I'm buying into you because you've just brought something to the conversation. And even if I don't buy from you, I walk away feeling value and you will feel valued because someone goes, wow. Okay. Let me, I gotta, I gotta really process this. I didn't even think that was my thing, but you just, you know, so it changed, it'll change the energy of the conversation. I love that. That's so right. So I feel like for me, instead of starting with the problem, because you're right, so many people don't know what their problem is, but they know what their goal is. So I feel like asking them about their goals and what they want for the future is better than asking them what their problem is, because it, it's like a, you don't know what you don't know situation. Absolutely. And so you just touch on something that I often will say, to, here's a shift in perspective. We're told and sold all the all the time. We need to know our clients' pain points. But if you push on people's pain points, what's your problem? What's not working? What's ba, ba, ba? It's like someone punching a bruise that you already have in your arm. You're like, go away from me. When you can activate aspirations instead of pushing pain points, that's when you start to see a shift. So that's what you're saying. Where you're like, oh, oh, I just, I just hear where you want to go with your business. I can completely see that for you. See, now you're speaking about what they want. Because nobody really buys what they need. Nobody buys what they need. People buy what they want. So I think when you can have those couple little um, reframes, it will shift everything. I feel like you're, you're like giving me all these aha moments and I need to redo my little application for a sales call for people. I have, <laughs> before we say, I mean, I know you could go on and on. This is amazing. So people, I am going to link to your website, lisadad.com. So people can find out more about soul sales. Um, so they can get that in the show notes or the description of this video. Um, to talk to me about urgency. Cause I know this is a big part of sales too, like creating urgency and yeah. something that drives me crazy, but I know it's just like, the way the game is played is like the fake urgency. I never felt comfortable doing that. I don't feel comfortable doing that. So tell me how people can create a sense of urgency. Like you said, like, give me a no as fast as a yes. Absolutely. First of all, the fact that you feel that bad about fake urgency, that energy translates and no one else will feel good about it either. Okay. So that's that natural approach. If it naturally feels really awful, it's going to naturally be received in an awful way, whether people get that's what it is or not, it'll just feel the elephant in the room. Okay. So um, the, the urgency that's out there right now, it's like, oh, the cart's closing in 24 hours. Oops, the email link broke. So I'm opening it for two more days. Like it, everybody does that. There's no way that everybody's cart breaks. Like it's just false. It's scarcity. It's bullying in my opinion. <laughs> so don't do that. Anybody. How we create urgency is understanding why it is urgent for that person. So you started to get there a little bit when you asked the person, how important is this for you to change? Now, I would say, remember that little tweak in, in, in the suggestion is understanding what's most valuable to the person on the call and then understanding what it is that um, why that would be um, important to deal with now. Like what's the value in them solving that now or sooner rather than later? 
Um, and that's going to be different for each person. And the, the way you get into that question will also be different depending on how the conversation rolls out. But the frame has got to be, if I'm asking the right questions at the end of this call, I'll understand what's most valuable for them. And we'll have a conversation around that. Got it. That makes sense. So it is going to be different for every person exactly. depending. Yeah, and that I'll, makes I'll, sense. I'll give you, this will be quick. So we'd have to dive into this another day, but there's three C's I use in terms of people's urgency. First, it's clarity, connection, and confidence. People need to be clear. They need to be clear on what it is they actually want. And if you can help them get there, you've given them some clarity. Clear on what they want and clear that what you offer actually fits. Okay, that's clarity. That's important. Connection is the big one. They have to connect to what it actually will mean for them. Are they connected to the value? That's the value piece that if I solve, okay, yeah, yeah. Someday I, my social media media needs to get fixed, for example. Um, but what's the connection with the value of fixing it right now kind of thing. And then the third one is confidence. And the confidence is twofold. It's confidence say that if I hire you, you're the person that's going to help me get there. And also confidence that I actually have the ability to do it. Because sometimes people will lack confidence on their own. They're like, oh my gosh, Christina, you're brilliant. I don't know that I, I'm good enough to work with you maybe or something, right? Um, or I've got the right business, whatever it is. So there's three C's for you. When you can get all three of those aligned, um, that is like a three-legged stool that will increase people's willingness. Perfect. And then one last question, and then I'm going to turn it over to you if we've left anything out. Talk to me about how you can remove any kind of objections before they're raised. I'm going to guess you're doing this through the conversation. So it's not like wait to ob address the objections at the end, but give me a little bit more. Maybe I'm way off. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> no, you're totally buying into that. So here's the, and I'll give you a little tweetable as well, right? <laughs> here's the other one is um, look for alignment, not agreement. So if you can look, if you are going for alignment throughout the conversation, you won't have objections at the end. Okay. And I say alignment over agreement because people often when they're trying to sell or they think they need to sell or they have to convince people their offers the right thing, you need people to agree with you. You need to say, yeah, you're absolutely right. This is totally worth the money. And I totally have to do it today. Well, nobody needs to actually agree with you in order to buy from you. They just have to feel the alignment. So as you're going in your conversation and you're asking them questions and you're filling in some gaps and you're giving some, some feedback about the way you do work, the idea is think about a matchmaking compatibility type of a thing. It's like you're, you're, you're dating each other kind of thing, right? Like you're, you're, who are you and who am I? And would we fit together? Does this make sense together? And if I'm looking for alignment along the way, instead of agreement, there's less likely to be an objection at the end of the day. So I call them alignment checks rather than letting them get to objection handling. Ooh, I like that. I know I said that was my last question, but I have one more. <laughs> I sure. feel like everything you've covered, it kind of makes us who hate sales look forward to sales calls. But like, what can we tell ourselves before we get on a call or during a call that can make it more fun for us if we are somebody who just like doesn't like doing this stuff in our business? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing I would do is we often, um, so we it's like negative memories stick with us stronger than positive ones. So I would say viscerally get into your body and remember what it felt like in a good sales call. If you already have a few of your own and you, you realize, oh my gosh, I had that call with that person and I felt so good afterwards. I felt like I served them before they even started. You can go there. The other alternative is when you think of sales, if you're thinking, oh, that time I went to the Apple store and that total you know, loser was trying to sell me a computer and he was so pushy and he was, I want you to think of the positive one because every single one of us has at least one situation where a salesperson changed our lives in some way, like gave us some option we didn't even know existed or was super supportive when we were overwhelmed. Or can you think of one right now, a situation where actually you're like, oh my God, that person was brilliant at sales. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I can think of a few, but I'm thinking like just me personally, like I invest in a lot of business coaching and mentorship and masterminds just because I know like 
how crazy business changing they are. So I'm just thinking of like, sometimes when I go into those conversations, I usually have my mind made up beforehand. Yeah. And the call is either like, oh, I'm a hundred percent saying yes to this or like, Jesus Lord, I'm saying no. Cause this sales call like ruined it for me. It's like really one or the other. Very rarely am I ever on the fence. Yeah. So that me too, usually, by the way. So I <laughs> see so you and I might have similar soul language in that way. Um, so I want you, that's why I want you to think about if you can even go into it, think about even a situation in a store, maybe where you went to buy a car or you went to buy clothes or something. Oh, yes. Yes. I, yeah. I, I have so many bad yeah. ones with but a car to- and then like one good one with the car, because that's the car that I bought and you keep cars for years. <laughs> right. And why was, why was that guy good or girl? Woman? Um, the guy was good because honestly, he made it fun and it was really like a no pressure thing. And he actually listened to what I wanted. And then when I think of like my real estate agent, like, I don't know if they're necessarily a salesperson, but like yeah. buying or selling a house, that's like quite the process. Yeah. And my real estate agent just made the process fun. Honestly, like when I think of those big purchases, like when you're physically going somewhere, it's the person who made the process fun. Perfect. And you've said the word fun a lot. So even when you were saying, how do we make this process more fun for you? It's the word fun. So in different soul languages, someone else might go, um, someone else might say, how do we make this process ease and peace and harmony kind of thing? You're using the words fun, right? It makes sense. Cause remember at the beginning, when I was asking you about who you were for your friends, you were like, I want to be creative and I want to be fun. And I bring my friends together and I'm the cheerleader and I'm the one who sort of brings the fun. <laughs> so you, you start to see your soul language. It comes out everywhere. So even when you were a little kid, you were creative and wanted things to be fun. So guess what you get to be when you're in sales conversations? I get to be the fun one. Oh my you gosh. You just you brought this full freaking circle, Lisa. There you go, darling. See, you get to bring the fun and you get to be creative with it because you also talked about how fun it was to create new things. That's why you can see visions and build paths for people. Cause you're like, mm-hmm. you've got this creative vision for them. And so when you're on a sales call, it doesn't need to be different. And you don't have to actually be doing the work that you do in order to bring the energy of fun, no pressure, creative fun to your conversations. I love that. Lisa, tell people where they can learn more about you and what you do at Soul Sales. If they are just like, okay, we just eavesdropped on Christina going through sales training. I want to go through it. What do they do next? Yes, absolutely. So uh, the easiest way to find me, you can look on LinkedIn at Lisa Dad, and it's D-A-double-D, or you can go straight to my website at lisadad.com. And again, dad is double D, D-A-double D. And I'm going to make it super easy and link to that in the show notes. Thank you so much, Lisa. This has been amazing. You're welcome. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can get all of the information that we talked about in this episode in the show notes. And if you are listening slash watching this on YouTube, then check out the description in the show notes. And if you're listening on the podcast, then make sure you head to my YouTube channel because I also post these on YouTube nine times out of 10. The camera is turned on so you can see us in action as we are recording our podcast episodes. So make sure you tap on the link in my bio on Instagram and what you're seeing on LinkedIn. If you're on MediaMavenAndMore.com, all of the places, I make it super easy for you to find me in all of the places, whichever one you're originating from. And I will see you again next week on another episode of Become a Media Maven.